Okay, today we're going to talk about how the Indians of Texas have changed since 1492. So, uh, along with the misconceptions we've already addressed concerning American Indians, you know, most people think American Indians as only hunter-gatherers, living one with nature, that kind of thing. Um, well, hopefully everybody realizes by now that, sure, that's true among some groups, and it's certainly true among some groups of Indians in Texas, but... We also have Indians like the Aztecs down in Mexico, and in Texas itself, we have Pueblo Indian cultures like the Juntans at La Junta de los Rios. We have the Caddos over in East Texas that belong to that Mississippi culture. So Indians, very complex, very different from one group to the next. No amalgamous uh, American Indian group, okay? So that's one misconception we've hopefully cleared up. Another misconception that people have about American Indians is that they remained stagnant uh, after the arrival of Europeans. So, 1492, we had these Indian groups living one way. You know, they, they live in certain parts of the country, certain parts of Texas. And then people think, okay, well, you fast forward up until 1800s or so, and everybody's going to pretty much have remained the same. You know, Indian groups are still going to be living in the same place, still living a similar way of life, despite the fact that Europeans have come in with all this new technology and they've had all this interaction with Europeans. Well, hopefully, um, this lecture will show you that by 1750, the Indians of Texas are very different than they were in 1492. Now, we're going to have a lot of the same groups here, but they have changed and they've uh, developed new technologies, they've moved to new locations. Now, again, a lot of them are going to be the same in certain ways. You're going to have similar language. A lot of them are going to grow the same food. But interactions with Europeans have changed some groups in, in, some groups in a lot of ways. Um, we've already talked about one of these groups and how the introduction of Europeans have changed them. And we've already talked about these Apaches at length. Okay, So the Apaches, if you go back to 1492, were hunter-gatherers. They would uh, walk around these southern plains from one place to another usually in groups of a couple dozen maybe at most uh, hunting buffalo and constantly in search of food they had domesticated dogs but other than that they lived off buffalo products occasionally planted corn uh, you know and then they would gather up prickly pear cactus that type of thing for sustenance they were hunter gatherers well by 1750 or so right where we're focusing on in this lecture the Apaches still are hunter-gatherers, but as we've mentioned, there's been one major change with the Apaches. They now have the horse, okay? And this horse, as we've mentioned, has completely revolutionized the Apaches' way of life. So, the Apaches before, you simply couldn't have more than a couple Apaches in a group because, you know, they, there's only a certain amount of buffalo they can catch in a smaller group. Well, once you get the horse, you can start killing buffalo in much larger numbers. All these extra calories are going to allow more than just a couple dozen people to survive. So what we're going to see is that the Apaches will go from just being a couple dozen people to having Apache rancherias is what they would call them, of, you know, hundreds. And sometimes you'd have even Apaches occasionally uh, roam around together in, in bands of that could number over a thousand, okay? Um, so these Apaches really started to flourish with the arrival of the horse. By the way, the, the Apaches, their population is going to go up because of this. Uh, and because of the fact that a nomadic move from one place to another means they're not going to be as susceptible to smallpox. Um, you know, if you have these groups living distant from one another, then uh, it's less likely to have smallpox transfer from one group to the next. So their Apache, or the Apaches' population has actually been going up. Um, since the arrival of the horse on the southern plains. As we've talked about, the Apaches have been using this horse to expand their range across the southern plains. We're going to talk more about this. They've started to attack other Indian groups, uh, Coltecans in particular. They're also hunter-gatherers, but simply uh, they didn't get the horse first like the Apaches did. And the Apaches, this area is just better for horses to be raised than this uh, sort of scrubland down here. Coltecans have been particularly affected by the Apaches. And Apaches have been raiding the Spanish up here in New Mexico. And then um, they've been raiding places like San Antonio as well. The Apaches um, have started to actually raid the Spanish for goods um, like metal, steel. And some Spaniards, by the way, had illegally traded with this, the Apaches. So they'd acquired some European items. Okay, 
and the Apaches would supplement their horse herds through raiding as well. So they grew so powerful, the Apaches did, throughout the 1600s and early 1700s, that what we're going to see is the Apaches actually start to splinter into a couple main groups. Now before the arrival of the horse, if you looked at the Apaches, there are you know hundreds of smaller bands you know they share similar language but they not might not know one another but what we start to see with the arrival of the horse is you start to see some bands merging with one another some bands you know closely related with one another but you also see rivalries emerge between the Apaches themselves so they become so successful that you'll see one band or one group of uh, uh, Indians start to break off they're gonna share similar dialect similar language uh, dialect of uh, the Athabascan language. They're going to have similar clothing, similar hairstyles, and then a, a different group, maybe a little bit to the west, something like that, will have similar language, but they have their own particular dialect. They have their own particular style of clothing. They'll be considered Apaches, and somebody who's not an Apache might have trouble uh, noticing the difference between the two, but if you're Apache, you're going to clearly identify, hey, this is a this is also an Apache, but they're different than me. Sometimes these Apaches will work with one another, but often these groups will actually compete with one another. So as the Apaches spread out, they almost become victims of their own success that they start competing with one another for resources. Now there are a number of different major Apache groups, and classifying them is difficult. Uh, if you go, we were talking about New Mexico history, you would talk about the Hickoria Apaches, the Chiricahua Apaches, Membranos, Membres Apaches. Um, we won't go into those groups. The two that I want you to know are going to be the two most prominent Apache groups in Texas. One is going to be these Lipan Apaches, or if you're from Texas, you might say Lipan, but uh, Lipan Apaches is uh, how it's traditionally said. So the Lipan Apaches, one thing you'll notice about them is they're going to have more firearms than most other Apache groups. Now the Spanish had um, uh, generally kept firearms out of the hands of, of Indians. Again, uh, sometimes they got in the hands of Indians, but the French had not and so these uh, Lipan Apaches they're gonna roam around this area and occasionally through trade and we're gonna talk about this through intermediaries the Caddo's Wichita's would sometimes get firearms from the French sometimes actually the French would venture out here and trade firearms with the Lipan Apaches so the Lipan Apaches sort of this central Texas area is, uh, is, is where their range is going to be uh, right around this region as well and they would venture as far out uh, as East Texas sometimes. These are going to be the main threat to San Antonio. So that's one of the main groups of Apaches in Texas. The other group is these Mescalero Apaches. Again, if you're an outside observer, you probably wouldn't be able to tell much difference between the Mescaleros and the Lipons. Similar language, but they are going to have a couple of their own vocabulary words. They're going to have their own um, uh, uh, body art, things like that. As a matter of fact, you know, one of the things that distinguishes the Mescalero Apaches is this elaborate paintings they would do on their skin, uh, things like that. This is a later drawing of a, a Mescalero um, rite of puberty dance. And you would see these Mescalero Apaches have, you know, this dark paint that they would often wear in a battle. They don't have as much exposure to um, firearms as the Lipan Apaches. Um, and the thing with the, the Mescaleros is generally their range is going to be attacking somewhat into New Mexico, but also attacking these Spanish settlements down here in uh, what's today Chihuahua, uh, 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 Cohila uh, down here. So the Lipan Apaches, Texas, they're going to be attacking the, the area the Spanish consider Texas, also Nueva Leon down here. So Mescalero Apaches out here, very similar Lipan Apaches but different enough to where these guys sometimes compete with one another. And it's even more complicated than that because often you'll have inter-rivalry within these different groups. So just because you're Mescalero Apache and you have you know, certain uh, body paint characteristics, certain dialect, doesn't mean that all Mescalero Apaches are going to agree with one another. So you'll have maybe a rancheria of a hundred, couple hundred here, rancheria of a couple hundred up here. Maybe this rancheria makes a treaty with the Spanish of New Mexico. This rancheria does not. This rancheria raids the Spanish of New Mexico. Maybe, you know, Spanish, first of all, they're going to be confused and they 
consistently have problems making treaties with the Apaches because they're all independent, one band to the next. Um, so you'd have difficulty with Spanish, and sometimes you'd have difficulty between the various groups because one group of Mescaleros might not like that another group is uh, impeding on their territory. Uh, another thing uh, about Mescaleros, you do have some buffalo out here, but Mescaleros, a lot of their um, uh, food sources is going to be uh, from hunting deer in these mountains. Lipan Apaches, they're primarily buffalo hunters. That's how they're getting a lot of their protein. Uh, both these guys, again, they occasionally plant food. Apaches will plant corn every once in a while, so they're semi-sedentary. But both of these guys would also steal um, food from the Spanish, uh, particularly carbohydrates, to supplement their diet. So this is very big change from the Apaches in 1492. Another group that's going to uh, change by 1750 is the Wichitas. So the Wichitas, back in 1492, as we mentioned, they're sort of a cross between the Apaches and the Caddos. They are semi-sedentary, meaning that they can stay in one place for a long period of time, grow corn, beans, squash, uh, live in villages, sometimes really big, but a lot of times, you know, just a couple dozen, maybe a couple hundred people. Um, and the thing about the Wichitas is sometimes they'll stay in one location for years, but then other times they'll become almost entirely nomadic and they'll, you know, when buffalo are plentiful, they'll go out in the plains for a long period of time and they won't stay in one place for very long. So it's this sort of in-between group that's part Caddo, part Apache. Well, the Wichitas are going to greatly benefit, and they're going to greatly change uh, from the arrival of the Europeans. They're going to benefit, and I should pause here, and I'm going to say a lot of these groups are going to suffer from disease, and the Wichitas are absolutely going to suffer from disease when it's first introduced, not as much as the more sedentary groups like the Caddo's, who are living right next to each other, uh, will lose a lot of their population. Same thing uh, with the Huntons. We'll talk about them later. But uh, Wichita's, because they are a little bit more nomadic, they're not going to be hit as hard by disease, but they will be hit by disease. But they are going to benefit with the introduction of the horse. So being part uh, hunter-gatherers, the horse, just like it makes the Apaches better hunters, it's also going to make these Wichita's better hunters. Um, and also the Wichita's, they're closer to the French and the Wichita's are actually going to serve as sort of a go-between uh, for the French and the Apaches and later we're going to talk about this group, the Comanches, um, uh, you know, these Plains groups uh, to get these goods from the French. The Caddo's will as well and we'll talk about that in a second here. So the Wichita's will have firearms, they're going to gain the horse, and in a lot of ways they're going to uh, uh, benefit from the arrival of Europeans. Okay, so that's another Indian group that has changed uh, because of the arrival of Europeans. Another group that will change, oh, actually, uh, with the Wichita's as well, we're going to see uh, a couple different groups of Wichita's um, emerge. Again, there's no Wichita chief, there's no grand, grand council among the Wichita's. So you will see a couple different uh, types of uh, Wichita's. Like, here's one example of some Wichita's. Looks like this particular group. Is more hunter-gatherer focused. You, you see the uh, firearms they're carrying probably from trade with the French. Um, you see European clothing, uh, or at least that, that garment right there, that indicates there's been uh, trade with the French. And um, this particular group, again, Wichita's, they, uh, they plant food uh, on occasion, sometimes for years on end, uh, and that's what they're doing here. So both hunter-gatherers at times, um, and then planting food at times. And again, sometimes this could be within the same year. Maybe you spend half the year at one location, sedentary agriculturalist, but then uh, another another part of the year you go out and be hunter-gatherers. So the Wichita's uh, started to see significant changes. Again, their, their primary semi-sedentary thing had not changed. It's just that they you know, had access to firearms from the French and they become more efficient hunter-gatherers. And actually, you can maybe say the Wichita's they be, they become more traders as well. Again, uh, serving as go between between the French and those Plains Indian groups. So that's how the Wichita's have changed. Other groups that have changed uh, with the arrival of Europeans is going to be the Kowaltekans and the Karankwas. Well, the way these groups have changed is pretty clear, at least in the case of the Kowaltekans, and to a lesser extent with the Karankwas. 
As we mentioned, the Coltecans start getting pressured by these horseback riding Apaches, and the Coltecans, a number of these groups, are going to say to these Spanish missionaries, will you please establish missions among us and let us live with you. Some Caracuas will also go into missions. We talked about La Bahia, not that many. As a matter of fact, most Caracuas are going to continue to live their traditional way of life. They're pretty distant from the French, so they're not going to have access to firearms. So you'll find a couple Caracuas that have entered Spanish missions, but most are living a very similar way of life to the way they were in 1492. They are semi-sedentary, and then they spend part of the year uh, at one location planting, but every year they make this migration to the coast where they hunt uh, or they fish uh, for a good part of their sustenance. And actually, the, one of the only major ways you can see the Caracuas have changed is they've developed sort of this hostility towards uh, Europeans. Uh, and so uh, that's part of the reason you, ha you hadn't seen many Caracuas go to those uh, Spanish missions. So Caracuas, not that much change, although again, a handful of them had entered the Spanish missions. Coaltecans, on the other hand, there's a, a couple of Coaltecans that have not entered Spanish missions but a number have and this group by entering the missions as we've been talking about for a long time now they're going to begin this process of Hispanicization okay so basically the priests will teach them Catholicism the priests are going to um, show them how to grow European crops the priests are going to keep them on this regular schedule you know of going out every uh, every day to plant food then coming out uh, coming back to the mission at night to um, uh, attend church and the Coltecans first generation there's a big transition a lot of Coltecans and we're going to talk about this a little bit more in a second uh, had actually left the missions uh, other Coltecans um, um, uh, most Coltecans had stayed in the missions in first generation there's some degree of Hispanicization but after a generation or two you're entirely raised within the Spanish sphere of influence you know whether in the mission or after generation or two you know you sort of live outside the mission maybe you work as a ranch hand for a rancher uh, whatever you know sometimes even as a soldier you are essentially Spanish after a certain point they are an Indian and as we talked about when we talked about the caste system you're not going to be viewed as equal in a lot of ways to Spaniards but you're essentially a Spaniard and that you speak Spanish you dress in Spanish clothing you eat Spanish style food um, uh, and, and again, genetically, you may be entirely American Indian, but you're Hispanicized. So this would be the Coltecans. This would be an, another example of, you know, how Coltecans would live after they've gone through this mission missionization process. So either you live in the mission yourself, or you know, again, after a couple generations, maybe this is a a home outside of the mission. All right. Um, some Coltecans did not accept missionary life. And it's kind of interesting because you would have some that would flee from missions, try to live on their own. As we're going to talk about, some Coltecans either, you know, said, I'm going to go ahead and would rather deal with the Apaches than enter missions. And you, as we're going to see, some of them stayed out of the missions. Some of them went to missions for a short period of time, but, you know, didn't take to it. They escaped the missions. Some, some of these are brought back by soldiers because the way the Spanish priests regard it is once you start conversion, you can't uh, go off of it. You're an apostate or a Ladino is what they would say. So maybe that's what's being depicted here. The Carrizos are one particular group of Coltecans. And by the way, Coltecans remember for the mission process, hunter-gatherers, no chief Coltecan. It's just small hunter-gatherer groups. Um, just like the Chichimecas, and essentially Coatecans are Chichimecas. All right, so uh, what's depicted here might just be, you know, uh, a man that left the the mission, um, and maybe his wife stayed in the mission, something like that, and she became Hispanicized. He did not. All right, so that is how these Coatecans have changed very much since 1492. Other groups have become uh, very much Europeanized by 1750 or so but not through the mission process alright one of these groups that's become more Europeanized is the Caddos so as we've, we talked about the Spanish attempted to establish missions among the Caddos in the 1690s uh, basically you know hey guys we got some Spanish goods coming to missions initially the Spanish welcomed them but then 
kicked him out uh, after a period of time. Once the goods ran out, the Spanish started introducing disease. The Spanish tried to set up the missions again uh, in the uh, 17 teens, but the Caddos stopped attending the missions. They didn't ever really attend the missions, and part of the reason was because uh, why would we attend these missions when we get the goods from the French over here who started settling uh, in this area in the early 1700s. Uh, and again, most of these missions among the cattle will be abandoned and, and placed over here in um, uh, San Antonio. So there's really only Los Adace that's among the Caddo's um, in the mid-1700s, but almost no Caddo's at attend the Los Adace mission. So the Caddo's are not getting Europeanized through the mission process, but they are becoming Europeanized. And as a matter of fact, by the mid to late 1700s, Caddo's in a lot of ways look like what you would think a European would look like. Again, genetically, maybe darker skin, maybe uh, different phenotypical features, but they wear European clothing. A lot of caddos speak European languages. A lot of caddos um, grow European crops, as a matter of fact, and you know, in some ways are indistinguishable from Europeans. How and why did they become this way? Well, it owes to the Caddo's location here in East Texas and West Louisiana. So you have the French have settled here in Lower Louisiana by uh, uh, early 1700s, 1700 or so. We've got the French here and the Spanish early 1700s, 17 teens uh, have, have got these missions here in East Texas. Um, and again, maintaining Los Ades here. Well, through this having the French here, having the Spanish here, and the Caddo's are essentially in between them, this place in between two European powers. Now it would seem like this might be a bad place for an Indian group to be in. Um, you know, maybe Europeans are um, take them over, the disease factor, something like that. And certainly the Caddo's have been affected by disease. All the way back to DeSoto, we think uh, smallpox has hit, it's decimated their population. But over time, we think they've developed immunity. So, be, between these two groups, you are going to have waves of disease, and that's a negative. But neither group is going to be able to dominate the Caddo's because what's going to happen when we have the French here, the Spanish here, is the Caddo's are going to sort of serve as middlemen for these two groups, and they're going to be able to play one side off another. So, let's say the French start. In interfering in Caddo territory. The French generally uh, less hostile to towards American Indians, so this might not be the case, but for argument's sake, let's say the French interfere here, the Caddo's might go to the Spanish and say, hey, the French are creeping up on us. Will you, you know, give us some support, maybe give us some firearms, or which would be rare, but the Spanish might do it in this case, um, uh, to help us defend against the French. So the Spanish provide the Caddo's with support as the French start to impede upon them. On the other side, you know, maybe the Spanish are doing something the Caddo's don't like. The Caddo's then go to the French and say, hey, can we get your help against the Spanish? So the, the fact that they hold this middle ground is going to allow the Caddo's to essentially start prospering in the mid-1700s. Uh, they're going to start acquiring trade goods from both groups. Again, the, uh, the French are going to be trading with the Caddo's for cattle products, uh, some fur, things like that. And both groups are going to be trying to buy the friendship of the Caddo's because they see them as allies against the other Europeans. So the French want to be the Caddo's buddies because it helps prevent Spanish expansion. And the Spanish want to be Caddo's buddies because it prevents French expansion. And again, so much trade is going to happen with the French. A lot of Caddo's will learn French. And then, um, you know, just being near the Spanish and then the handful of Caddo's going into the Spanish mission, again, not very many, learned Spanish. So what all this means is that by the mid to late 1700s, again, the Caddo's um, have acquired a lot of European clothing. A lot of them speak either French or Spanish. And they've become Hispanicized and, uh, heck, I don't know what the right word for Frenchicized is. I'm sure I'm, I'm missing uh missing the right word there, but they've be adapted and adopted, uh, adapted to the presence of Europeans and adopted European customs. So that's how the uh, Caddo's have become Hispanicized, or become Europeanized. A different group of Indians has also become Europeanized, and that's going to be these Juntans uh, at La Junta de los Rios. So here's La Junta, so there should be a little bit more up here. But here at La Junta de los Rios, these Juntans, these Pueblo culture people, have also started to adopt 
European customs as well. Now this isn't going to be because they're between two European groups. Again, Spanish are here in New Mexico. They're all the way around down here, all the way over here. But the French are all the way over there. So how did the Huntans become Europeanized? Well, it's not going to be through missions. We mentioned before the Spanish briefly set up a mission here in La Junta de los Rios in the late 1600s. Didn't last very long. The Huntans kicked them out. Uh, probably were calling them in because facing pressure from the Apaches. We, so it wasn't through the missionary process. It was actually through, we believe, contact with Spanish settlers down here. So you had all these Spanish silver mines in this area, a lot of Spanish settlers, civilians. Well, initially, you know, civilians had had uh, some disruptive contact with the Juntans. But, and again, you know, disease had been introduced to uh, La Junta de los Rios. And we think by 1700 or so, the population of this area has probably been reduced by, you know, 8, 80%, something like that. But those that survived the disease, they're now close to these Spaniards, and a lot of these Spaniards down here need workers. And you have these Huntans that don't have access to goods. They don't have the French over here. So what we think is that these Huntans started to do this yearly migration to work in silver mines down here. Uh, the Spanish established a couple farms down here. And so every year the Huntans would come down here. You'd have a Spanish farmer. You know, I need somebody to help me grow wheat, something like that, uh, works for this guy for a couple months, helps with the harvest, then maybe use the profit to buy some Spanish clothing, uh, and then while the three months that they're there, maybe attend church a couple times, learn a little bit of uh, Christian rituals, uh, maybe you know learn a little bit of Spanish, come back up here, introduce it to the population that remain behind, and this happens year after year, uh, late 1600s into the early 1700s. As a matter of fact, the Spanish go, uh, we don't have a lot of expeditions into this area, at least not a lot of recorded expeditions into La Junta de los Rios, but one of the first expeditions after the failed attempt to establish missions among the Juntans, um, it says basically uh, the Spaniards go in and they notice that the Juntans are growing wheat, they are raising cattle. Again, cattle are not native to the Americas. They're brought by the Spanish, but now the Huntans are raising them. And here's a quote. They said, um, the Huntans, quote, wore clothes in the Spanish fashion with shirts of fine white linen worked in silk and had adopted a basic form of Christianity, seemed to be in monogamous marriages, and many spoke Spanish. So the Huntans have become Hispanicized by proxy. They simply live by the Spanish and are surrounded by them uh, in that that you know through you know desire for Spanish goods through um, working in these these Spanish farms down here they'd essentially become Spanish so you can almost think of La Junta de los Rios at this point even though genetically Indian it's essentially Spanish now uh, by the mid 1700s all right so that is uh, how these two groups have changed We've also seen other significant changes. Oh, by the way, this would probably be something like La Junta de los Rios would look about 1750. Um, again, it was a Pueblo culture town, so you had these small single story, sometimes uh, multiple story buildings at La Junta de los Rios. Um, Spanish came, started working in, in the Spanish farms, maybe started bringing some of these European style clothing back. And by the way, you know, Europeans or, or the Spanish had adopted some Pueblo culture um, characteristics such as the adobe home so kind of the Pueblo culture influenced Spanish culture just as much as Spanish culture was influencing them so La Junta becomes Hispanicized the Juntans are almost you can almost say they're Spaniards by now alright what about the Humanos this is this group we mentioned that we're not sure their relationship with the Juntans they either are this trading branch of the Juntans that would go to East Texas and trade with the Caddos in 1492 or they were you know just buddies with the people of La Junta de los Rios and they uh, were just trade you know with the Pueblos trade with this East Texas bring these goods back and forth across the plains um, again this sort of mysterious group these Humanos what about them have they become uh, Europeanized Hispanicized like the people of La Junta de los Rios we don't know for sure this is one of these big mysteries in Texas history because essentially after about 1715 or so 
references to the Humanos disappear. Nobody is uh, referring to an Indian group known as the Humanos. It's essentially they're gone from history. Now, the question comes up, what happened to them, all right? Well, we think one of the things that happened is Apache expansion. So the Ap Apache start expanding. So this is going to help cut off this trade with East Texas and these Caddo's. You can't get through these Apaches. Um, so that's going to be something pressuring them. Um, you know, Spanish come in here to New Mexico. And so these Humanos, they're going to basically have a choice. We can get killed by the Apaches. Maybe we can become close with these Huntins. Maybe the Humanos, they start, if they are Huntins, they start living permanently at La Junta de los Rios. And they sort of, just like the rest of the people at La Junta de los Rios, sort of become Hispanicized by work down here in these Spanish um, silver mines and, and farms. So maybe they just sort of blend in and they become Hispanicized like the Huntins. So that's one explanation with what will happen to the Humanos. Um, maybe they just, again, blend in with the La Junta de los Rios. Another explanation, oh, by the way, also supporting that is the fact that, you know, again, the. Um, in 1500s, 1600s, this East Texas area in particular is facing a lot of disease, um, you know, and so their trading partners are getting reduced significantly. And then maybe when the French show up, maybe the the Caddo's don't want to trade anything with the Humanos because they start trading with the French. You know, we're not going to trade you anything good. So could be multiple factors. We think the big thing's Apaches. So maybe they just started to blend in. That's the sort of friendly uh, explanation what happened to the Humanos. A lot of people think they were simply driven to extinction by the Apaches. As the Apaches come in, start cutting off the Humanos, basically through war, attrition, that style of thing, they killed off the Humanos, adopted the women and children into the Apache tribe, and the Humanos, their distinct language, um, cultural beliefs, things like that was just annihilated by the Apaches. And evidence for this, we have one of the last references to the Humanos is somebody referring to the Humanos, uh, this group of Humano Apaches, which basically says the groups were merging, uh, and then as they merged, more Apache than Humano took over, and so they were driven to extinction. So that's a different change in uh, Indian groups in Texas. Another thing we're going to see happen in Texas is not just the extinction of Indian groups, but the emergence of new Indian groups, like the ethnogenesis is what they'll call it. Ethnogenesis means, if you think of Genesis from the Bible, that's creation. So this would be the creation of an entire ethnicity uh, out of nowhere. This is going to happen in two places, uh, one place within Texas, and it's going to happen outside of Texas, but it's going to greatly affect Texas. So we're going to see the creation of new, unique Indian groups. One, um, This, by the way, is uh, be an illustration of the Humanos. One of the groups that's newly created is going to be these Tonkawas. Tonkawas, and this is going to be around this area today, hill country around Texas. And the Tonkawas that are going to come out are going to be... Um, hunter-gatherers, they occasionally plant food, they occasionally plant corn, beans, and squash. Being in the hill country, it's not a plains area, so horses are going to be a part of their culture. They're going to adopt the horse, but it's not going to be instrumental to their culture like the Apaches. So they'll, uh, being in the hill country, you know, it's, it's sort of trees around the area, not plains, so there's not as many buffalo. So the Tonkawas will hunt buffalo, but they're going to sustain themselves off deer, occasional fishing, and uh, so you can kind of almost think of them as an amalgamation of a lot of these different groups we've been talking about. Because they are in the area around San Antonio, they will have some contact with Europeans. They're going to be able to uh, get their hands on firearms in a couple different ways, either through intermediaries and trade with the French, or through taking them from the Spanish, fighting them. Uh, couple different ways they will acquire firearms and they're going to acquire some European style clothing. So we have this sort of amalgamation group here in Central Texas. Where did they come from? Where did these Tonkwas come from? What we think is the Tonkwas are essentially these Coaltecan groups that did not want to enter missions and uh, but you know didn't like getting killed by the Apaches started coming together. Maybe Karankwa groups you know, maybe um, some Karankwa groups wanting, you know, um, 
you know, uh, to ally themselves with one another for war purposes, or maybe Karankwa groups that started getting hit by disease. Uh, you start to see multiple different groups come together. They start merging with these Coltecan groups. We think maybe uh, some uh, Ladinos or apostates that fled Spanish mission come among these Tonkawas. We think possibly um, some eastern uh, Caddos or, or some western Caddos or maybe some southern Wichitas came in here. You can almost think of the Tonkawas as sort of leftovers from all these different groups, people that needed protection from one group or another. If you're an, an apostate Indian, you, you want to keep away from the Spanish. You go out here to the Tonkawas. If you're a cold Tekken group, you don't want to enter missions, but you want protection for the Apaches. You start moving with merging with another group. If you're Karankawas, a lot of people uh, of your tribe die. Maybe the coastal Karankawas, you know, they've, they've taken over the coast where you normally go fishing and because you're a different Karankwa group, they're not going to allow you access to, to the fishing grounds. Whatever, you start um, merging with these different groups, and what we're going to see is essentially this amalgam culture and this culture that's going to develop its own language and um, uh, develop its own a living style. So uh, the Karankwas, they're not going to have teepees like the Apaches, and they're not going to have conical houses like the exactly like the Wichita's, it's almost going to be like a, uh, or Coaltecans, it's going to be like almost a merging of teepees uh, and then the sort of uh, uh, small houses you see with the Coaltecans, so deer skin houses, um, small uh, uh, wood covered houses, that's sort of halfway between um, you know the Coaltecan style house or temporary house and, and the teepee. So very diverse origins. Um, see here, uh, they a lot of their clothing. By the way, some is going to be steer, uh, steel, or not steel, but um, uh, leather uh, made out of uh, buffalo, made out of uh, deer. Um, some will also be this made of this fibrous material that's prominent here in Central Texas. Um, women make woven basket like Apaches, uh, but you know they also make pottery like other Indian tribes. So it's, you do some things like Plains Indian groups, you do some things like, um, you know, Cold Texans, you do some things like Karankwas, you do some things like Caddo's. It's almost where everybody who was not a part of a different group came together. So that's a new group that's in Texas. And by the way, the Tonkwas still exist today, so this is a newly created ethnicity uh, that, that still exists today. So that is another group in Texas final group that we're going to talk about, and this is going to be another group that emerges out of nowhere that's a culture that's born during this time period. It's going to probably be the most well-known Indian group in Texas. And again, this group is not actually going to be from Texas. And this is not an Indian group that was in Texas in 1492. And it's not an Indian group that existed in 1492. That is these Comanches. So the Comanches are these hunter-gatherer Indians, we believe they're coming from the Shoshone group up here, maybe a little bit in northern Colorado area, something like that, that at some point as the Spanish bring in the horses, so first horses start getting to the plains in the uh, 1500s, but really after that southwestern revolt, we start seeing horses get everywhere. We believe some of these Shoshones get their hands on the horse, and they think that this horse is such an important animal that they're going to abandon the rest of their Shoshone ways and completely convert their way of life to the horse. And when I say completely convert their way of life to the horse, completely. The Apaches still occasionally plant food. They don't spend all their time on their horse. You know, they will have months uh, sometimes where they stay in one location to harvest and plant their crops. Uh, so they are you know the Apaches are mostly nomadic but they they are sedentary once in a while the Comanches are entirely nomadic they're going to spend their entire lives moving from one place to another whether hunting raiding uh, and things like that because this uh, and this is going to be all based on the horse basically the Comanches will use the horse to raid use the horse to hunt and not going to stop in one place for, for more than maybe a couple weeks at most okay so um, it's going to be interesting because if you're a hunter and you're constantly moving from one place to another, sure you're going to be able to hunt buffalo easily. You're going to have no problem acquiring protein or fat. Buffalo can take care of that. 
Carbohydrates are a different matter. If you're moving around on the southern plains, which is where this group of Shoshones that breaks off is going to uh, end up, you can again occasionally find prickly pear cactus, but carbohydrates are going to be in short supply. Well, this is what makes the Comanches interesting and different than the Apaches. Instead of planning for, uh, occasionally planning for their carbohydrates, what the Comanches are going to do is entirely rely on raiding to get their carbohydrates. So what they'll do is they'll get on their horse and they'll either raid Spanish farms in New Mexico for corn or they'll raid the Apaches. This is going to be a big rivalry we're going to talk about. Um, they'll raid uh, Apaches, you know, their, their occasional uh, planting of corn. Um, Initially, they'll raid the Wichita's, although the Wichita's are eventually going to ally themselves with the Comanches. And essentially, they use the horse to acquire their carbohydrates. They don't harvest at all, so this means they spend more time on the horse than even the Apaches. And because they spend more time on the horse, they're going to be even more accomplished horsemen than the Apaches. So, the Comanches, if you were to have a Comanche warrior face off against an Apache warrior, let's say that both are armed with lances, both are going to be uh, very accomplished, maybe even more, uh, uh, probably more accomplished than any Spanish horseman. Uh, but the Apache, I'm sorry, the Comanche is going to be better simply because they spend even more time on the horse. The horse is more important to them. Um, you'll see right here, this is a, a, patch, a Comanche technique. What they would do is um, they'd actually use their horses as shields and win battle. Like say they're raiding an Apache camp or they're raiding the Spanish. And by the way, a lot of times when they raid, they would also take women and children. The Comanches relied, uh, their population is going to grow substantially because they're such efficient hunters, but they also want to grow their uh, population through um, acquiring the children of other groups, acquiring women of other groups. Uh, some people think that's because they spent so much time on the horse that, you know, that's going to cause birth defects. It's going to cause... Um, you know, premature birth in women might, if you can imagine, a man, you know, uh, reproductive system after riding on a horse for most of the year. You can see some problems there. Um, so uh, these Comanches, again, to, to supplement, they're going to start uh, having these captives. But right here you see this guy. He's firing over his horse. So, like, if this were an Apache, this is another Comanche, but if this were an Apache, this would uh, this guy would uh, uh, be protected from the Apache by his horse. His horse might die, but he would survive. Another guy's doing the same thing. Uh, Comanches could also flip under their horse to fire arrows, uh, basically upside down because they spent so much time on their horse. And the Comanches are going to um, essentially again merge out of nowhere on the horse. And the way they're going to have fun is horse racing. The way that they're going to uh, live again is raiding with the horse. They are these horse people. Basically, their uh, life gets uh, uh, developed around the horse. And again, uh, they start out just as a uh, small group, but because they're so successful at hunting and raiding other Indian groups, that um, uh, their population is going to grow. And essentially, we're going to see these Comanches start very small. first mention we have of Comanches is, is right here in, in New Mexico. Uh, the Spanish hear about these uh, people and they're going to ask, uh, it's, it's actually this other group from New Mexico, these Utes, who are these new people? They speak a different language than we've ever heard, spend a lot more time on their horse, and the Utes are going to answer, they're the Comanches. And what the Utes were actually saying in the Ute language was, those are the people that attack us all the time. So Comanche essentially means the people that attack us all the time. And so they begin here in this small area and through raiding, raiding the Spanish, and actually also capturing Spanish women and children, incorporating them, hunting, population continues to grow. They're going to start moving down here into Apache territory. They're going to um, be, again, better, more efficient warriors than even the Apaches, start attacking them, taking them in. And then they're going to start moving further in. And this is going to uh, cause this Comanche raiding sphere. Some people even are going to argue that by the mid-1700s, they basically create an empire where even uh, the Apaches are either pushed out or they basically have to ally themselves with the Comanches. Apaches are not very rarely going to ally themselves with the Comanches. Wichita's will ally themselves with the Comanches because basically if they don't, they're going to get killed. Uh, final thing before we talk about what this expansion is going to mean for the people of Texas uh, in the western area and over here, uh, the Spaniards, uh, we need to point out 
The other thing that's going to distinguish the Comanches from the Apaches is that they are a cohesive political group. So whereas Apaches, individual bands have their own leaders, sometimes fight with one another, where you have cultural distinctions between Mescaleras, Lee Ponds, Chiricahua, um, the Comanches, they are going to have some regional differences, but they are going to meet every year. They're very democratic, and they're going to agree never to fight another Comanche, and they'll always support one another, and they basically have a council just about every year to decide what they're going to do as a Comanche people. So they're basically a united uh, Indian group, and this is going to be, I mean, you would almost compare it to um, like the Aztecs. You know, we had this Aztec empire. They're all meeting together. It's not a monarchy like the Aztecs. It's a democracy where the leaders decide what the Comanches are going to do. And this is going to allow them to uh, work together instead of against each other. And this is, as we're going to see, this is going to displace the Apaches. It's going to drive the Apaches into the Spanish. And it's going to cause this huge war for the southern plains.